Thank you, guys. You know, that's, uh, I was sitting here looking at the group, and, you know, I, I, maybe it's just me. I like to name groups if they don't have a name. And so that's three guys and a Hall of Famer is what that is right there. And so, uh, but for those of y'all who don't know, Jimmy was inducted into the North Carolina Athletic Hall of Fame uh, last weekend, right? Was it last weekend? So lots of things to celebrate uh, here today, lots of people to celebrate, and just a, a great time here with the, our church family. If you have your Bibles, turn with me to 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. As you're getting there, um, I'll just share one of the things that I've been thinking about uh, for a while now that I've been noticing and, and sort of worried about with, uh, and it, with this, it's not even just the American church, it's, it's churches all over the place, is there seems to be a, a mixing of the sacred and the profane, and the uh, the things that we tend to focus on and worship honestly uh, are not what what the Bible would classify as sacred. And what I mean that is the the things of lower importance within our life, not not even within the church, but just as we are all, all called to uh, to walk the Christian life, no matter where we are, not just in the sanctuary on Sunday morning or whatever it may be, but the, the elevating of the lower things to high importance and the, the decrease of the sacred things to, to really a, a profane level. And when you do this, the, the, the only logical progression is that eventually church itself becomes profane and not sacred or marriage itself becomes profane and not sacred or any of these things that, that the Lord has given us to glorify himself. You know, not just for our good, but they are intended to glorify God. And when we do that, lower the sacred and increase the profane, our view of God naturally diminishes. And God himself naturally diminishes within the world. And we become easily influenced by sin. And we become easily turned away from the, the morality or the plan that God has for our life. And this is what is happening not inside the Thessalonian church, but by some on the outside of the Thessalonian church. This is what this section of the letter, when, when Paul is writing, this is what is, is being discussed, and he's really trying to encourage the church to, to not mix the sacred and the profane, to not be fooled, to not be deceived, influenced, shaken, scared. Instead, to trust the Lord and trust the word of the Lord to guide us in everything that we have to do not just within the church, but within life. And what this section shows us is that there's not only pressure and persecution coming from unbelievers, but there is also at least one attack coming from those who claim to be a believer, but have mixed the sacred and the profane. And so if you have your Bibles, read along with me as I read chapter 2, verses 1 to 12. It says, Now concerning the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and our being gathered together to him, we ask you, brothers, not to be quickly shaken in mind or alarmed, either by a spirit or a spoken word or a letter seeming to be from us, to the effect that the day of the Lord has come. Let no one deceive you in any way, for that day will not come unless the rebellion comes first, and the man of lawlessness is revealed, the son of destruction who opposes and exalts himself against every so-called God or object of worship, so that he takes his seat in the temple of God, proclaiming himself to be God. Do you not remember that when I was still with you, I told you these things? And you know what is restraining him now, so that he may not be revealed in this time. For the mystery of lawlessness is already at work. Only he who now restrains it will do so until he is out of the way. And then the lawless one will be revealed, whom the Lord Jesus will kill with the breath of his mouth and bring to nothing by the appearance of his coming. The coming of the lawless one is by the activity of Satan with all power and false signs and wonders and with all wicked deception for those who are perishing because they refused to love the truth and so be saved. Therefore God sends them a strong delusion so that they may believe what is false in order that all may be condemned who did not believe the truth, 
but had pleasure in unrighteousness. And so while the event under discussion in this passage is the return of Christ, that is the, uh, the concern within the church, that is the, the subject that some who claim to be believers have, have started to, to turn other believers away with, all this is done with the deception that happens with all of the doctrines of God. Paul says, Do not be quickly shaken in mind or alarmed either by a spirit or a spoken word or a letter seeming to be from us. So even if it's even if supposedly from an, an apostle with apostolic authority, to the effect that the day of the Lord has come, let no one deceive you in any way. This is the fifth mention of the return of Christ within First and Second Thessalonians. So obviously this was a a topic of of teaching whenever Paul was with them. Obviously it's a a topic of concern now that Paul has left them. And if we think about our day, we too are interested in the return of Christ. Are we not? We should be. We should be looking for it. When Christ will come back, and it says here in verse 1, when we will be gathered to him. This is something that we look forward to with anticipation, and it's also something that some of us obsess over. You know, I've, I've never really uh, been a, one who obsesses over eschatology or uh, end times prophecy or the book of Revelation or anything like that. But every church I've ever been in, this is, this is a, a topic of interest. And, and I can sort of understand it because lots of the Bible, if we look at the Bible, lots of it is past tense. You know, we get our guidance, we get our morality, we get the, the word of the Lord from from events that have already happened, from people who have already lived, from the the Holy Spirit that has spoken the truth into their lives and then they have written it down for us and we read it and so the the Spirit speaks to us as well. But when you look at eschatology and end times and revelation, that is in the future. And so that is something that we we look for and we can obsess over. And so I, I do understand that. But we can also get a little too obsessed uh, with it. We can also look at it in terms of this is the only thing that we focus on and we, we don't see the Word of God at work in our own life. We're waiting. And I think Paul, too, was concerned about this within the church. He encourages the church to trust God and what God has said through the apostles in the past and in the present age, not just in the future. He reminds them that trusting God protects us from the influence of false teachings as well as protecting us against sin. As we seek the truth about God and about the future and about today, we must remember that knowledge of God gives power over deception. The more we know about the word of God, the less likely we are to be taken in by some false doctrine or some sinful deception that someone else is is delivering to us. When we are looking for an event like the coming of Jesus Christ, God has given us benchmarks, things to look for. Paul says, starting in verse 3, Let no one deceive you in any way, for that day will not come unless the rebellion comes first. And the man of lawlessness is revealed, the son of destruction, who opposes and exalts himself against every so-called God or object of worship, so that he takes his seat in the temple of God, proclaiming himself to be God. That word for rebellion is apostia, which we get the word apostasy from. And uh, within the Baptist heritage, we we don't like the word apostasy uh, because apostasy is the idea of of turning away. And, you know, we are very much the perseverance of the saints people. We are very much the once saved, always saved people. And so we don't like the idea of, of someone who claims to have faith and then turns away from their faith and you know, I've had lots of discussions about this, and, and it, really is, it really is splitting hairs, uh, whether you say someone can lose their salvation or whether you say, well, they just weren't really saved in the first place because their, their profession is no longer that Jesus Christ is Lord. Their actions no longer uh, show a person who is committed to the cause of Christ. But there is a turning away, and that is what is described here in the On that note, I will get into a a little bit of eschatology for the moment. When we see passages like this in 2 Thessalonians 2, or we see Matthew chapter 24 would fall into this category. Revelation 19 would fall into this category. We see things described that that do not have a clear understanding. Here in, in our passage for this morning, it is the man of lawlessness taking his seat in the temple of God. 
Revelation 24 is the abomination of desolation standing in the holy place is a description there. Revelation 19 is the beast and the false prophet who had deceived the world. All of these things are, are not clear. We wish we had a name. We wish we had a date. We wish we had a place for all of this to, to happen. Speculating on these things has made people lots of money and has led to dramatizations and TV and film and books and all sorts of things, but no one knows exactly what it's going to look like. And that's why this passage, 2 Thessalonians 2 and, and others like it, are so important because Paul does not give a specific description either. But what he says is, do not be shaken. Do not be alarmed. Do not be deceived when all of these things are taking place. I personally believe, and this is a lancism, I do want to, to separate those out whenever I talk about the, the truth of the word versus my opinion. I personally don't think that Paul or Peter or any apostles knew exactly what it was going to look like. I don't think they were playing coy or anything when they were writing in this, this type of language. I mean, apart from God himself, I don't think anyone knows exactly what it's going to look like when Christ returns. Just because they were inspired with knowledge that they passed on to us does not mean that they were blessed with all knowledge. Just because the Holy Spirit inspired them to write does not mean the Holy Spirit inspired them with all knowledge of God. What the Lord has given us through the apostles' teachings is everything we need to know to please God. Everything that is true that we need to know to please God. There is nothing lacking in God's word for our salvation or for our obedience. But that doesn't mean that we have all knowledge about God located in the Bible. There are some things that are not going to be revealed to us this side of heaven. We'll have to see the Lord face to face. And so what Paul is essentially saying here is do not be deceived about false teachings that explain the coming of Christ because, and this is an important part for us as believers today, you will know it when you see it. Supreme Court Justice Potter Stewart famously said in 1964 when he was being asked his test for what is obscene material. This is at the height of the fight against pornography and these sorts of things. And Jester Stewart famously said, I'll know it when I see it. And I would argue that the Bible does, does give us a, a clear definition of obscenity and pornography and, and immoral material. But in terms of the description of the coming of the Lord, of eschatology, of the man of lawlessness of the abomination of desolation, of the beast and the false prophet. I believe what the Bible teaches us is be prepared. Study the word because if you are, if you are faithful, if we, if we humble ourselves before God and we don't fall into the deceptions of the world, then we will know it when we see it. And that's how we, can, we don't have to be shaken or alarmed or scared because we've been told about it. We will know it. But Paul doesn't just make this an academic exercise. He gives some practical advice to the church as well. He says, starting in verse 5, Do you not remember that when I was with you, I told you of these things? And you know what is restraining him now, so that he may be revealed in his time. For the mystery of lawlessness is already at work. Only he who now restrains it will do so until he is out of the way. This man of lawlessness is also often associated with the Antichrist. The word antichrist only appears in Johannian literature. It only appears in 1 John chapter 2, chapter 4, 2 John chapter 7. It doesn't appear anywhere, any other places within the Bible. But based on this description here that we have in 2 Thessalonians and, and other references within, within Revelation and Daniel, it seems to draw some distinctions with this figure, with this person. This is someone who will not overtly but covertly cause problems for the people of God. Will turn people of God away from the Lord. And what Paul tells us is two things. This person is already at work, verse 7. And this person is directed by the power of Satan, verse 9. We'll get into the second part here in just a minute. But let's focus on the fact that this person is already at work. Let's focus on the, the fact that lawlessness, the, the attempt to turn people, even the people of God, away from the Lord is already at work. We see this clearly in the way that the accepted morality of the world today is not biblical morality, is not what we find in the text of Scripture. 
But what Paul says about the work of God in the world right now is interesting. He says that God is restraining the full, effle- uh, full effect of lawlessness for the moment. There is more that Satan and the Antichrist and the man of lawlessness want to do to this world, but God is not allowing them to do so for the moment. They are being restrained. His power is greater than theirs. And if and it would not bring himself glory to let them loose at the current moment. If you think about the, the story of Job, I know that many of us are, are familiar with the story of Job, but if you think about the story of Job, we see at the very beginning that the sons of God, the angels of God, are going to present themselves before the Lord, and here is Satan presenting himself to God. And I always felt sorry for Job and, and all the bad things that happened to him. And as I got a little bit older, I thought about this. You know, not necessarily the things that happened to Job. I thought about Satan presenting himself to the Lord. And I just think to myself, what is this poser doing before the people of God? Why is he here? But he says, God says, what have you been doing? And Satan says, I've been looking to, throughout the earth to tempt someone. And God says, have you considered my servant Job? And this is perhaps the first illustration of don't be too good at your job. You know, because you're the one who always has to do things. And so here's the, the noble Job, and God says, have you considered Job? Because if you're going to, to give in someone this type of responsibility, it's going to be him. And so God lets Satan loose on Job. In Job chapter 1, verse 12, God says to Satan, Behold, all that he has is in your hands, only against him do not stretch out your hand. And we know what happens. Satan takes basically everything away from Job. And then he comes back and he says, well, I've been doing the same thing. And the Lord says, well, have you considered my servant Job? And Satan says, well, you know, you won't let me touch him. And so there in chapter 2, verse 6, God says, behold, he is in your hand, only spare his life. And we know the story that Satan is let loose on Job and does all of these things. And Job continues to stay faithful, but... If you look at the world and then you look at the book of Job, this is what the world would look like without the restraining power of God at work right now. This is, this is what would be happening. The, the trials of Job and the, the, the trouble that Job went through, that would be what all of us were going through if it wasn't for the restraining work of God in the present. God's grace defends the church against a lawless world. That doesn't mean the bad things won't happen. That doesn't mean that we won't do bad things or evil things. It just means the Lord is restraining the full effect for the moment. We talk a lot about the future blessings of God. We've got problems here, but one day in heaven with the Lord, everything's going to be fine. But friends, what about the things God is doing for us right now? What about the restraining work that God is doing right now? What about the blessings that God is giving us right now? Not in the past with Jesus Christ and not in the future with the promise of heaven, but right now the Lord is at work and he's caring for us. He is busy. I remember when I was was playing baseball in college. Baseball in college was a whole lot different than baseball in high school. Baseball in college and, and really all sports is a... It is purely based on what you produce. And so it is incredibly stressful because it is entirely performance-based. There is no mom and dad calling up the coach, hey, I'm upset, my son's not playing. They're going to say, I don't care, and they're going to hang up on you. Okay, this, this, is, this is what it was like playing. And I know we, we got some athletes here. I know Eric and Kayla uh, both played in college. Joey played in college. Taylor, uh, Josh uh, was involved in, in college athletics. And I'm sure it's, it's very much the, the same way it is. It, it's purely performance based. And I remember one time we were playing and the, the game that I was pitching, we had a, an umpire behind the plate who was who had a notoriously small strike zone. It was like this big that you're trying to, to throw in and they get to hit. And so it was, you know, we were complaining the whole game. The coach was complaining the whole game. We ended up winning the game, and, and me and another one of our starting pitchers, his name was Brian Henson, we were talking after the game, and Brian was saying, you know, you, you did a really good job to, to pitch to that strike zone. And I said, you know, thanks. I was just trying to keep the ball low, just let him put it in play somewhere. And about that time, our pitching coach walks by, and he said, it doesn't matter now. It's over. You know, you look the next week. It doesn't matter what... what 
you did, you just did. It only matters next week. We've already forgotten about it. And Brian and I are thinking this is some metaphor for life, but <laughs> it's not. It's just he was being a, a contemptuous person. That's what, all right. I had to search for a word because that is not what we used to call him. Uh, but, but they didn't care what had happened. They didn't care what had just happened. I mean, it was, it was purely, if you didn't perform the next time, they, didn't, they don't care what you, you just did. But when we look at our relationship with God and the work that the Lord is doing, we see clear indis- indications of God's work in the past. And we see clear promises of God's work in the future. But I don't want us, church, to miss that God is active and present and working with us right now, today. Restraining the lawlessness that, that, that wants to pull us away from him. It is just as important as the work in the past and the work in the future. Titus chapter 2 is a pastoral epistle. It's largely for those who would be pastors in the church. It says in verse 11, For the grace of God has appeared, bringing salvation for all people, training us to renounce ungodliness and worldly passions and to live self-controlled, upright, and godly lives in the present age. In the present age. This is the work of God right now. It's not isolated to the past or the future. God is protecting us from physical and spiritual harm. God is guiding us. God is blessing us in the present, not just in the past. But if this is the case, why is there still sin? Our sin and people who sin against us. Why is this happening if God is restraining all the forces of evil and the lawlessness of the world? Well, we see verse 8. It says, And then the lawless one will be revealed, whom the Lord Jesus will kill with the breath of his mouth and bring to nothing by the appearance of his coming. So this is future. And the coming of the lawless one is by the activity of Satan with all power and false signs and wonders and with all wicked deception for those who are perishing because they refused to love the truth and so be saved. There will be a point when all the lawlessness and immorality and sinfulness is released onto the world. And in that time, the spiritual warfare that is being tapered for the moment will not have that restraining force and the power and the influence of Satan and and what he is doing and what he is exercising, it will be greatly magnified for those who are unbelievers and for those who are believers. And many, many people will turn away from any semblance of devotion to God. But there's a telltale sign in this set of verses that shows how to prepare for this. If you look at verse 10, it says Satan is going to exercise this power and this deception with all wicked deception for those who are perishing because they refused to love the truth and to be saved. They refused to believe the truth. They refused to seek the truth. And so Satan's influence comes from our refusal of the truth. I'd like to take us to the book of James for a moment. James chapter 1, verses 13 and 14. The apostle James says, Let no one say when he is tempted, I am being tempted by God. It's not God doing it. For God cannot be tempted with evil, and he himself tempts no one. But each person is tempted when he is lured and enticed by his own desires. In the same way that this future time spoken of in 2 Thessalonians will be a time of great deception for those who refuse to love the truth and those who refuse to be saved, Our present situation, as James says, is a time of deception and temptation, not because God is failing in his goodness, not because God is failing in his restraint, but because we are being lured away and we are being tempted because of our own desires, because of our own sinfulness, because of our desire to turn away from the Lord. And so there is no excuse, there is no one at fault for our sinfulness except for us, We cannot say that that God is tempting us. We can also not say that the devil made us do it. The Christian faith is a faith of personal responsibility. You are not judged based on your family name or what your parents did. Even if they were disobedient and rebellious against God, you can choose to follow the truth. 
However, at the same time, if they were obedient, if they prayed for you, if they did everything that they could to, to create a firm foundation, you know, I was, I was incredibly blessed growing up. My, my family was. We were incredibly blessed in the sense that, that my parents, you know, who were not perfect by any means, but my parents made faith a priority, made church a priority, the, the discipleship and the fellowship of the gathered body. And this is not to say that we didn't engage with the world and didn't engage our community. We were active in a whole bunch of stuff. We were active in, in school and clubs and sports. And, you know, my, I was not a musician, but my, my twin brother was. He played piano. He played saxophone. You know, we, we were active in a lot of different things. But when it came to what we prioritized, faith was the priority within our family. Church was the priority within our family. And, and I didn't realize it then, but I do now, that that, is a, that was a great blessing that my parents passed on to me. At the same time, and hear me, church, being blessed does not equal being saved. It is a personal cho- responsibility and a personal choice that all of us have to decide to follow after Christ or to rebel against him. It doesn't matter what our upbringing was and how good our parents were to us. The ones here in first century Thessalonica who are being warned about falling away in deception, who are being encouraged. They were being encouraged to work on their profession. They were being encouraged to work on their family. They were being encouraged to to look out for their city. But Paul is also saying you need to study the word. You need to prioritize your faith because if you don't, you will fall into deception. You know, in the 21st century, there is, we've experienced, just in, in 23 years, we've experienced a, a lot of financial schemes that have taken people's money. The five largest Ponzi schemes of the 21st century conned investors out of a combined $70 billion. That's a billion with a B. The top five in, in you know, right around 20 years conned people out of $70 billion. And how did they get fooled? Because some of these guys, I mean, some of them were just... They didn't, they'd never done any investing before, and they just decided to give a little money away. Others, it was just a little bit, so it didn't, they didn't worry too much. Some of these guys, I mean, this is what they do. You know, they, they in, invest in these things with the hope of, of getting a big return. So how were they fooled out of combined $70 billion? It's because they, they knew the truth. They had the numbers. They had the skills. They knew how all this worked, but they... The, the promise was just too good for them. They, they were deceived. They were deceived by other people. They were deceived by themselves because of greed or some other factor. So just, the knowledge itself doesn't, doesn't matter unless we apply it. And I'm, I'm telling you, friends, spiritually, the world right now, not just some future time, but the world right now is a very deceptive place in terms of trying to pull us away from the morality of God and the way of God and the word of God. And when I talk about this deception and, and we see the work of Satan and all this, I, I don't want to think of the Hollywood version of spiritual warfare and demonic possession and all these different things, but I want to think about the influence of someone saying to you, hey, you've got friends. You don't really need the church. You can pray on your own and read the Bible on your own and you know, be a good friend to your, to your neighbors and all that. You don't need the church. Or someone saying, you've got God's grace, you, you know this is a sin, but you can do it anyway because God will forgive you. That is the influence of evil. That is the influence of lawlessness that is at work. It's being restrained, but it's at work today. Pulling people away from God and pulling people away from God's people. But even in our ignorance, even in our arrogance and rebellion, God is being glorified. Sometimes through us, working through us, and sometimes in spite of us. Verse 11 and 12 says, Therefore God sends them a strong delusion. Not Satan, not the man of lawlessness, but God sends them a strong delusion so that they may believe what is false in order that all may be condemned who did not believe the truth but had pleasure in unrighteousness. You know, Bruce Lee once said, I I love it when I can bring Bruce Lee into a sermon, but Bruce Lee once said, Showing off is the fool's idea of glory. And what he's saying here is all the flipping around and all the talking and all this stuff before somebody actually starts throwing punches doesn't really matter if the result is is always this person loses. 
showing off as a fool's idea of glory, he said. The results matter. And throughout the pages of Scripture, we see people who challenged God, people who defamed his name, people who hurt his people. And in the end, in every case, every section of Scripture, every chapter of Scripture, God is still glorified. Because God glorifies himself not just through our good deeds and our righteousness, but God glorifies himself in victory over sin. That's what's being talked about here as he closes out this section of the letter. People are taking pleasure in unrighteousness. As verse 10 says, they refuse to love the truth. As James 1 says, they are lured and enticed by their own desires. But God does not leave his people alone. God does not leave without glory for himself. No, it this leaves him with, with even more glory because his victory is even greater. Because it's over the people who were defaming his name. It's over the people who were rebelling against him. When we look at the book of Exodus, God sends Moses to free the people from slavery. And Pharaoh says no. And so in Exodus 14, 4, God says, And I will harden Pharaoh's heart, and he will pursue them. And I will get glory over Pharaoh and all his hosts. And the Egyptians shall know that I am the Lord. If we work with God, if we, if we obey the, the words of Scripture and we gather together as a church and we try and do the righteous work to the best of our ability, if we do all of this, God is glorified. But if we gather together and we rebel against God and we defame His name, God's going to be glorified then too. It's just going to be in a very, very different way. It's going to be in a victory over us rather than working through us. It will sometimes seem like in this, this time that the, the church is losing. It will sometimes seem like morality and the commands of the Bible have been lost. That they have been called ancient or bigoted or described some fairy tale of, a, of the past that we know is not true today. But my advice would be the same advice that Paul gives to the church in Thessalonica. Do not be shaken, church. Do not be ashamed. Do not be alarmed or deceived either by the spoken word or by the teaching of someone who claims to have the guidance of the Bible. We have our standard. Let me challenge you to double down on your study. Don't push the Bible away as a, as a relevant tool for its time, but not necessary for the enlightened 21st century. Because when we begin to turn away from the commands of God, even with the things that are considered small, it becomes a huge problem of drifting into the things that are no longer small, but the things that are doctrinally sound. We become disobedient, not just confused. And the closing verses of this passage tell us that we will either bring glory to God by the way that He has redeemed us, or we will bring glory to God by the way in which He defeats us. God sent Jesus to the cross to reconcile us back to himself, but that has always been and will always be on his terms and not on our terms. It will be based on his standard and not our standard. Just because we call it good, that does not make it good. And just because we call it righteous does not make it righteous. We have to ask, how does God feel about our thoughts, our hopes, our dreams, our lives? And we only know that from the Bible. This means that part of faith is making a daily choice. Is God going to be glorified through me or is God going to be glorified in spite of me? And every single one of us makes that choice whether we know it or not. I pray that he works with us and through us. I pray that he would trust, we would trust the guiding light of his word and that we would not refuse to love the truth and be saved, as Paul says here in verse 10 but that we would love the truth and we accept the salvation of God. Let's pray together.